when it when you press it and it's bright green, then it's live. So why don't we each test? Courtney, want to test? Testing. Testing. Testing one, two, three. You might need to bring it closer, Paul, because testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Um, can you, could you hear us out there, everyone? Okay. Yeah, I think the rule is keep it within like four to five inches of your mouth. Otherwise, if, if it's a little further off, it just doesn't pick up. So. Austin, you can let us know when you're ready. I think so. Yep. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> uh, do you want me to start all over? Um, no. no. Okay. Uh, channel 99, it is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting is also available on the city's website after the meeting. Our technician tonight is Walter. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. And I'll remind the staff to remind me about people who are on Zoom so we don't forget about that. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to have a roll call. Present. Commissioner Jensen. Present. Commissioner Wilt. Vice Chair Christensen. And Chair Westman. Here. Okay, now we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> So now we're going to move on to new business. Uh, first, we're going to have um, uh, any deletions, additions or deletions to the agenda tonight. I'm going to look to our planners if they've received any additions or deletions to their items. No, no additions or deletions this evening. OK, the next item is an opportunity for public comment. Uh, this is a short communication on matters that are not on tonight's agenda. Um, if you would like us to include your name in the minutes, uh, you can sign in. Uh, is there anyone here who would like to talk to us about an item that's not on tonight's agenda? Doesn't look like we have anyone. So the next item is commission comments. Do we have any comments from any of our commissioners you'd like to make now? Thank you. Um, the first comment, um, I just want to publicly thank the staff uh, for um, from our last request, last meeting about sending out the agenda early. We appre I appreciate that. I think other commissioners probably did too. And that was great. And then the second one, um, I attended a city council meeting uh, two meetings ago and spoke under uh, public comment and wanted to also share tonight um, that there's a group of community members that have gotten together for um, wharf enhancement. 
and um, we are going to, um, the group is going to be working with the community, with the city for community outreach on uh, funding for enhancements. So it's going to be a fundraising group. Um, mm -hmm. And we're very uh, excited about the opportunity to enhance the wharf. Um, and we're going to be a um, full uh, survey that was, will be going out. There's going to be a community outreach meeting that the city is going to be organizing and stuff like that. Um, and so we look at as the city develops the wharf and has those plans, um, what the community can do to contribute funds to make it a, a better place, more of a destination. So this is going to be similar to what was done previously for the library, where these enhancements are going to like improve the quality of the furniture that's there and provide some extra amenities? Correct. Um, yeah, so it's um, the structure of our group. There's myself and there's 10 other local Community members are on the board. Um, Gail Ortiz is one of our people that are on our board. And we're really structuring off of, after the Friends of the Wharf. And um, yeah, a lot around that same outline that um, it all just be, as we're calling it, the jewelry for the wharf. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else have any comments? OK. Uh, staff comments? Yes. Uh, this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our new assistant city clerk, uh, Austin Wesley. Austin uh, was uh, is from Santa Rosa. He attended Cal Poly and majored in recreation management. Um, he's very passionate about outdoors and he's a sports enthusiastic. He's also very interested in city planning so he's going to enjoy his time <laughs> at the planning commission meetings. Um, and he's been living in Santa Cruz for the last three years and calls it home and really enjoys his time here. So this is Austin. Welcome, Austin. We're glad to have you here. Thank you very much. And you can help keep us in line. <laughs> All right, the next item is uh, the approval of the minutes. And uh, I would request that we take them separately because I need to recuse myself on the April 6th minutes because I was not at that meeting. So we'll start with the minutes from March 2nd. Does anyone have any corrections or additions you would like to make? Yes, there's one minor correction on the approval of the December 1st meeting. Um, it voting yay should be uh, Christensen, Chair Westman, and Commissioner Woke and abstaining was uh, Jensen and myself. It's flipped. Okay. That's it. All right. Can I clarify? Did you say for the March 2nd minutes? So in the March, uh, yeah, so another. March 2nd minutes. March 2nd minutes, item number three, approval of minutes for December 1, 2022. As Commissioner Jensen and I were. Okay, can we get a motion to approve the March 2nd meeting minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the March 2nd meeting. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, can we just say aye? We don't need a roll call vote for this. Correct, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. aye. Okay, carries unanimously. And then, as I mentioned, for the April 6th minutes, uh, I need to recuse myself. But are there any uh, additions or corrections to those minutes? Uh, yeah, I do have one. Okay. Um, just I uh, wanted to clarify that, um, as Commissioner Essie okay. um, noted, that he attended the uh, Planning Commission training down in uh, Los Angeles. Um, I was also in attendance at that, and I think I shared that. But I just want to make sure that we exactly reflected that. All right. Okay, now we need a motion and I'll move on the April 6th minutes. I'll move. Second. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we can do a roll call vote since I need to abstain. <clears throat> Commissioner Esty? Aye. Commissioner Jensen? Aye. Vice Chair Christensen? Aye. And Chair Westman? All right, we're going to move on to our consent calendar. Um, the consent calendar are items that the Planning Commission considers to be routine and will be enacted in one motion 
uh, in the form listed below. Uh, there will be no separate discussion uh, on these items unless someone from the public or someone or one of the commissioners wants to pull the item. And tonight we actually only have one item on our consent calendar and it is a design permit and coastal development permit for an accessory dwelling unit above an existing garage at 603 Escalona Drive. So is there anyone uh, on the commission who would like to pull that item? I would like to pull or I have some clarification on one item. Okay. Um, so we will just move that down to be the first public hearing item because um, I don't think it probably will take too long. Um, so with that, we'll move on to our public hearings. And the first public hearing will be 623 Escalona Drive, the design permit for the accessory dwelling unit. I'll have a staff report. Yeah, good evening, Chair Westman and Commissioners. Uh, if, if there is just a quick question, I can take that, or I have a, a slideshow, so. Uh, it's just one quick question, just for clarification. Um, um, with regarding the, um, as I read the report, we required um, a staff uh, requirement was to have, the, I think it was the kitchen window opaque in, um, from a code standpoint. And if I recall, um, we approved um, application number 230067 um, on the February 2nd uh, planning commission meeting at um, uh, at I think it was 603 Escalone uh, no uh, Saxon it was no, it was it was on Saxon uh, one, one, 117 on Saxon um, and we waived that requirement as um, as a um, planning commission and so um, I just wanted to meet some have a commission have a conversation with the commissioners just about, about consistency um, being that they're first obviously in you know almost in the same neighborhood and so that's why I would like to just uh, point that out I guess we're asking the question of staff about uh, why was it recommended that that particular window be okay? Then so, we'll talk about it. so the, yeah, the recommendation for 117 Saxon, uh, that the, the similarities between that project and this one are that they have walls within eight feet of a property line, uh, but there is a specific section that is applicable to ADUs only uh, that requires uh, opaque windows within eight feet of the property line. So um, that is specifically written in with the other project at Saxon. It was a staff recommendation um, because that was a... Co this one was an ADU unit, which has different requirements for ADU units than for standard single-family residential units. And so if they're uh, both second story the only difference would be that uh, accessory dwelling unit would still be occupied by community members. And so since it's an ADU, like a secondary dwelling unit, they have to have an opaque window. But if it was if it's just a normal residence and it wasn't ADU, it wouldn't have to? Yeah, I, I'll say that the commission has discretion over in both cases as well without requiring a variance. So in the case of just standard floor area, uh, there's a design review finding the ADU, there's a section that allows the commission to deviate from objective standards without requiring a variance. So it, it really is at your discretion. And I just want to clarify, um, so Ryan, the standard is for the opaque windows for second stories for ADUs along the property line. Any interior window on an ADU on the second story? Is that required? It's any wall within eight feet of a that's when it's required. So it's not always required. So anytime you have a window that faces into the lot and is not within eight feet, that requirement would not. Um, Sorry, I'm a little confused. So the eight feet rule, eight foot setback of the second story applies only to ADUs and not the standard. Like if I'm building a two story house, I don't have that requirement. Correct. So within our ADU ordinance, we have objective standards because many of them are approved administratively. And those in the 
in the objective standards, that's one of them is that for a second story ADU, so if you did a conversion of a second story to have an ADU, you'd be required to um, put in the different way at the film for privacy. I did wonder about that. It's kind of strange that on a kitchen. I see that it makes sense of a bathroom, but the kitchen didn't make a lot of sense. I was wondering why it was like that. Is the applicant, is the applicant here? Yes. Hello. I didn't mean. To I just wanted to ask: Did you elect to? Do you mind the window being opaque? I would prefer it not to be opaque. Sorry. Um, there's a beautiful. It overlooks my neighbor's front yard, and there's a great view down the street to the gulch, um, looking at redwood trees, eucalyptus that we don't fall. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would be great if it didn't have to be. Hey. Do you have a good relationship with your neighbor? Or? I do, yes. Um, where is it? Can we it? <laughs> so I guess I'm looking at the plan because I know we did. I'll be honest, I didn't pick up on that. So the kitchen window. <coughs> Here's the aerial, and then so you plan it's here. <laughs> the ADU is stacked directly above the garage. The window in question is about mid mid wall on the I believe this is the east side. So in elevation view, it's here. Yeah. And their house does start probably three or four feet on the ocean side of the of my garage. So they're offset. So their house is here and ADU would be here. If that makes sense. Okay. So what is the pleasure of the commission? I'd like to make a motion to approve the project but remove the requirement for the opaque window. I will second that. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Esty? Aye. Commissioner Jensen? Aye. Vice Chair Christensen? Aye. And Chair Westman? Aye. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, moving on to our regular public hearing items. Uh, the first one is 1440 Wharf Road, the Capitola Wharf. And this is a review of final design of two public bathrooms for compliance with condition number two of permit 20-0141. Um, this project received a coastal development permit issued by the California Coastal Commission previously but was conditioned to come back to the um, Planning Commission uh, for several items. And so we'll start with a staff report. Yeah, and I, before Sean begins the presentation, okay. I just wanted to uh, clarify a couple things. I really appreciate Commissioner Jensen bringing this up actually at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so the project before you tonight is for the, the wharf uh, proposal that the city has been looking at for some time now. Um, in the meantime, this uh, wonderful group, a community group has come together and is looking at wharf enhancements um, and they're raising funds and really like making, adding those special elements of like, should it be the same benches we've always had? What about lighting considerations and plaques and er all, all the things that uh, interpretive signs that all the details that really will uh, make it even more special. So uh, tonight you're not reviewing 
those items, um, we, uh, if it's just benches moving forward, I don't think that's something that the Planning Commission needs to review. But if there are substantial changes to the wharf, um, we can bring that back to the Planning Commission. Um, and so I just wanted to clarify the difference of these two. It is. It sounds like it'll be a really robust public outreach process with the wharf enhancements. Um, and so I encourage the Planning Commission can participate in that as well. And then it'll just ultimately be what, what have they put together as towards whether or not it should come back to Planning Commission unless directed otherwise, okay? Um, so this evening the focus is on the plans we've looked at in the past and um, this is planning to go to City Council next week to put the project out to bid. Thank you. And we have our Public Works representatives here. So Kailash Manzavar is here next to me and Jessica Khan, our Public Works Director also here. Good evening, Commissioners. The application before you is uh, located at 1400 Wharf Road, also known as the Capitola Wharf, located in the MUV Zoning District. It involves the review of the revised plans for four design elements included in the approved Wharf Rehabilitation Project. Uh, the larger project scope includes a widening of the narrow stretch of the wharf, new restroom facilities, and a replacement security gate, as well as various repairs and upgrades throughout. As mentioned before, we have the Public Works team here who will be providing you with the majority of the presentation. So the original application was evaluated by Leslie Dill, architectural historian, who found the project to be substantially compatible the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties, provided that several elements received a subsequent review by the city once further details were prepared. The elements included the wharf piles, prefabricated bathrooms, the entrance gate, as well as the replacement security gate. In the report, Leslie Dill noted that the differentiated utilitarian, sorry, the modern and utilitarian designs were in keeping with the standards. Examples included the uh, larger restroom design, which was differentiated with a completely flat roof, as well as exposed stainless steel components, which is also a similar theme to the other modern additions like the security gate and the smaller bathroom. Since the original approval, the revisions no longer include alterations to the entrance gate. It will now be relocated towards the foot of the wharf but will otherwise retain its current appearance. The 2020 approval <clears throat> followed with those recommendations from the historian by including that as a modified condition to bring the project back specifically so that the Planning Commission could review these four items with respect to various considerations, like design, scale, materials, location. Um, as mentioned before, the location of one of those is subsequently changed and, and the presentation will show those locations of the rendering following this. Um, the overall intent here is to review these elements uh, for compatibility with the historic uh, status and, and as mentioned before, it, it was actually seen as, as a benefit to keep these modern components differentiated from the historic look. With that, I'm going to hand off the presentation to Kailash. Good evening, commissioners. I'm excited to be back here today. It's been, yeah, I can't believe it's been this many years since we were here last, but it's it's a it'll be it'll be nice to walk through this project with you here today. Um, and as Sean stated, um, at that last meeting we had in, in June 2020, we had four elements that we hadn't fully fleshed out, and so coming back to you here tonight to provide the detail on those um, and, and seek your approval to move forward with the project, um, going to uh, going to City Council next week on Thursday. 
So first wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a timeline of kind of what brought us to where we're at here today. Um, this is the, a banner that we have now placed out on the wharf that provides you know, the community some background on, on the steps that have been taken um, up to today and then the plans for where we're, where we're going here in the future. Um, some of the things that may or may not have already been aware to you as commissioners is this project began back at least back in uh, around 2016 or 17 when the, when the city had identified the need for looking at the wharf for, for improved resiliency and strength. Um, having seen damage over the years, they wanted to identify ways to, to enhance the wharf to, to make it a little bit more robust over time. And so the studies were done by the Moffat and Nickel engineering team. And through those studies, we then went to planning, to, to had multiple public outreach meetings, and then as well went to city council with quite a few different uh, design alternatives. And, and there was a, quite, quite a few steps in the process that decisions were made to get us to the point that we're here today. Um, our, our, our goal here is to kind of bring what we we left um, unfinished in 2020 with the Planning Commission, resolve those tonight, and then go seek uh, approval from Council next week uh, to move forward with bidding the project and, and starting the repair and enhancement of the, of the wharf. It, with that, we would end up having a goal of having the wharf completed, uh, construction completed the summer of next, of next year, 2024. So again, just to rehash a little bit here, this was uh, the design alternative that City Council approved in October of 2018 that char charged the Public Works team with moving forward with this design. And so the, up, the upper two um, drawings that are sketches were, were part of that um, alternatives analysis that was, was prepared to look at options for what the city could do to provide more resiliency for the wharf structure. Um, with the guidance and direction from council, we move forward with this design. And then we have at the bottom of this, this slide showing you the current design that we have. So you can see that it, it mirrors that design that was sketched out in 2018. So the first element that we wanted to uh, speak to were the, the new piles. So there's a improved pile type that we are utilizing and have already utilized for some some repairs that have taken place since that meeting that we had. So the existing piles on the wharf are all old timber piles and they have a lifespan and they've, they've lasted quite well, but there are new pile types, which is uh, it's a composite pile that allows for, um, it's just, you know, in, in the look and feel, it's, it's about the same size and diameter, but it's much more robust as far as its ability to last over time in the marine environment. You, you still do end up with um, attachment of, of you know barnacles and things like that, which was part of the design review with uh, uh, with Leslie. Um, but it, at the same time, it does also allow for those piles to be much more much stronger and also can be built off of in the future if we were ever to try to move move uh, vertically up with the with the wharf structure. So here you have an example of what the piles look like at the far end of the wharf at the head. These piles were replaced as a, a phase one of the of the wharf enhancement project. Uh, the second slide shows the piles near the the landing, uh, uh, and you can see just from a distance, you know, the 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 color of the pile it blends in pretty very well with the existing piles. And at at a distance, I think most most passerbys aren't able to distinguish the difference. If you get up and touch it, you'll know. But otherwise, it, you know, the look and feel still provides kind of the stick framing structure of what the wharf looks like. Here's a close up of that pile again. You know, even at this scale, it's, it, it's, it's hard to quickly dif differentiate the difference between the two. And then this is the base of the wharf where we also have another pile type that was used um, in, in the past when the wharf was widened at the very foot of the wharf. Uh, the, the piles in the background of that screen, on the, that's the hooper side of the, of the wharf. You can see our, if you look closely, it's a different, it's a different material. It's again a, 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 a FRP style pile. That, that is in line with the, the piles that we'll be using for the uh, wharf redevelopment project. The next element that we had to bring back to you were the two entrance, the two gates. So there are two gates on the wharf. One is a entrance gate that has kind of our iconic 
a photo opportunity for visitors who come to the wharf and want to take a picture at Capitola Wharf. Um, and the second one is a security gate that's uh, kind of three quarters of the way out towards the wharf closer to the two businesses. In operation, the way that these gates are utilized, the entrance gate primarily stays open all year long during both day and night. Uh, we really only use that to close when when the whole wharf is closed down for either for security or if we know if if there's you know instances where we know there's large storms coming and we're, we're not sure you know whether or not there might be a dangerous situation out there that's when that gate is closed but otherwise that gate is almost always open the second gate the security gate down towards the businesses those are closed when the businesses close shop at night and and that was put in place uh, years ago when there were different times where there was issues that were happening with uh, security risks and I think things you know had gotten broken into and so the security gate was placed and and that does close every night and that's mainly closed by the by the tenants that operate those two buildings so looking first at the uh, entrance gate so the proposal here is because the project widens the narrow section of the wharf that is currently where the entrance gate is is situated the we're, we're doubling the width of that narrow portion of the wharf to add <coughs> strength to it and so in order to still accommodate and keep this historic art piece that was was uh that was done i'm, I'm not sure what year but when that was created we wanted to maintain that and so in the permitting and public outreach process there was a lot of concern about maintaining this gate and so the opportunity presented itself kind of naturally that if you just slide it forward that that same width is there and so it'll match and so you just we're just proposing to move that gate forward to be closer to the, the immediate entrance to the wharf this is one view from the, uh, the, uh, the road side of the wharf and then I have another view on the opposite side Jerry you might remember that day um, so that's another view of it showing kind of where it is positioned so you can see that the wharf width right there it, it's kind of hard to eyeball but it we did we did a lot of close measurements and I've talked with the architect that designed this the, the structure that it'll be we'll be able to accommodate its its relocation there without without any problem it doesn't uh, conflict with any of the utilities or any of the other items that are running underneath right oh yeah uh, so that's moving on to the security gate um, so this this is the, the the look and feel of the existing security gate again closest to the outboard end of the wharf um, and, and is closed uh, nightly uh, and that's why that gate is a little bit more robust you can see it's a little taller it has wings that extend beyond the outside edges of the wharf to prevent you know people from trying to get over or around it and our proposed design is was to match this exact gate design but needing to accommodate the new width of the wharf so you can see here this is the plan drawing of that wharf of that gate matching pretty closely is you know as much as possible to the existing and then again showing you from the opposite side and this picture gives you the opportunity to see so if you look at the bottom of that photo that corner where where the the uh, railing goes to about a 45 degree angle that's approximately the new width of the of the future section of this wharf and so that's going to extend all the way into the into the background to match again with that width of that wider section at the base of the wharf and so this gate will need to span that full width uh, but it'll still be the same style gate where it just has two gates uh, on rollers that'll roll open um, and, and then accommodate the ability for people to walk to and from on, on both sides so moving on to the bathrooms um, when we brought to you, this back to you originally uh, in June of 2020 um, the plan was to put two bathrooms um, at both ends of the wharf one to provide uh, facilities for for both people using the wharf and then also for beachgoers who are maybe using Hoopers or the area immediately in front of the Venetian courts um, if any of you have used the you know the, the beach here you do know that the only public restrooms currently are the ones over at Esplanade Park which is a bit of a jaunt if you're if you're at Hoopers and uh, seasonally we do put a porta potty right now out on the wharf and it gets highly used and so the goal here was to provide a, a permanent facility that allowed um, visitors to have restrooms 
um, at this section of the wharf, uh, both serving the wharf and, and, the, and the public beach. The plan for both of these was that the foot, the one at the foot was to, to provide a permanent use rather than having a seasonal porta potty. And then the one at the head, the design and the intent there was that we, we do currently have a restroom built into the building that is the wharf house. Uh, it's on the far, it's on the western side at the kind of southwestern corner of that building. And the, the intention here was to provide a public restroom that wasn't tied to that facility, allowing some flexibility for the current or future tenant to kind of reimagine the way that that building gets used. There's, there's been often a desire to be able to have windows facing Pleasure Point, and currently that area is, is blocked by the existing public bathrooms. And so the intention here was to provide a, a new bathroom location was public serving and also then allowed flexibility um, at that building. In addition to this, this was part of our um, part of our commitments that we made when going through the grant and permitting process. So currently, we have three different grants for the for the wharf project, and we have um, pro, I think that's six or seven permits, and all all of which. Um, we made commitments to providing these visitor serving facilities. And so this is something that we, we definitely need to have as part of the project. And so um, after that meeting we had in 2020, we, we started you know fully fleshing out the design plans. And in looking at the location for the head of the wharf, um, the, the, there's, it's quite a constrained area. So I have a, a couple pictures to show you that here. So this is the location that we're, we're proposing that bathroom to go. Um, it's existing use and, and future use also will be to also house both the rest the bathroom dumps or the, the trash dumpsters and it's also serves uh, as parking stalls for the couple parking spaces that we do have out at the wharf the project doesn't propose to have any new parking and that was that was a strong recommendation from our public outreach and so we didn't want to take away any of the existing parking given that it's fairly limited so in this space, it doesn't look like it can accommodate it, but you want to have, a, have some bathrooms, have the ability to roll the dumpsters out, and also be able to park. And so in doing so, you, you need to have a, very, a fairly compact bathroom design. Um, and in order to do that, the, the Public Works team did quite an extensive search of prefabricated bathrooms that could be utilized in this uh, environment. And get another factor that we had to take into consideration is just that we're in a marine environment and um, there's a lot of challenges with having a facility out there that's gonna last over time. Also is, is serviceable and, and can be maintained well and, and have a lifespan in this marine environment. Can I add just one? Um, I, I just wanna, the, the two buildings that are on the wharf, they've, we've um, inspected them to a point to know that they're not going to fall down on someone and we allowed, <laughs> We allowed the tenants to go back in and remove their things, but they they have yellow tags on them now. They need to be further studied. So there's also a question there about when those bathrooms will be able to be uh, utilized again. So there might be uh, significant work that needs to be done in order. So I think having the the restrooms out on the end of the wharf is a great safety in case that those if and that extensive work needs to be done to those existing structures. So thank you. Sure, thanks for adding that. And so here we have a, set, a zoom in on the plan set showing exactly where we're proposing to have that bathroom. Uh, the design of the bathroom right there, it might be hard to see, but we've got one that's proposed for to be installed and the second location will be plumbed, but current design plans only have us uh, adding one bathroom here. Uh, but in the event that we start to see that there is demand or need for an additional bathroom, it would be easier because we're already plumbed and ready to go to have that second bathroom installed there. Um, yes. And then the other factor that was a, something that we learned to appreciate was that this is a tight space, both for uh, once it's installed, but also from just an installation perspective. So being able to bring in a prefabricated bathroom um, pro provides some challenges. So one being that it's between these two buildings, it needs to be placed by a crane. Um, in order to 
replace a, a, an object like that by a crane, you have to have you have weight tolerances that you're working with. And so we ended up um, after going through quite a few different prefabricated bathroom design options, there were there weren't as many as you would have thought that would fit here because of those limits. So we had to have a fairly lightweight um, bathroom uh, and then also one that provided kind of all those things that being ADA compliant and also being able to, to kind of sustain um, in the marine environment. So through that, that research, this is where we landed on and feel that this is a good solution for its location out there at the head of the wharf. Here's a a uh, close-up look of what the bathroom provides from a from aerial so you can see that the bathroom provides a toilet wash basin and also provides the opportunity for a, a children's changing table um, on the right hand side you see a picture of the bathroom uh, the brand of the bathroom is a Portland Lou um, it was and it, it's uh, you can I think I have one more picture with a little bit better view of it for you oh no I don't that's it. Um, so th that bathroom is made, they, they come in different materials. We've selected the, the stainless steel option because of the marine environment. And it does show, it does have the opportunity if on that wall of the, which is the round wall facing us is the, is the door. You, it says the Portland Lou on this one. And there are, uh, there is opportunity if, if we decided to do so to put some type of artistic um, mural or something on that side. Uh, but otherwise the, the structure would be made of stainless steel, um, being that that would be fairly well serviceable if we had graffiti or anything of that nature. It's easy to clean and easy to to, to maintain over time. Moving on to the second bathroom, uh, the location of the second bathroom was proposed to be um, there uh, west of that yellow line. And the reason for that being that the we, we still have vehicle, although there's not a lot of parking, there is still vehicle use on the wharf with vehicles coming in and out for deliveries, for trash, and then for the, the small number of parking spaces that are out there. And so we did not want to have that bathroom have any conflict with the vehicles that would be going up and down the wharf. And so we, the space that we've selected, um, we tried to tuck it over into that corner there, um, allowing for the, the ramp to the bathrooms and the three three stalled bathroom doors would all be facing towards that yellow line. So you, you, the back of the bathroom is, is facing Hoopers and then the doors are facing Capitol and Main Beach. This, okay, this plan uh, drawing just shows you where the bathroom is. Uh, the red line, oh, that's to show where the, um, the security gate or the, the, the entrance gate moves um, from where its current location is uh, forward to closer to the, the, the front of the wharf there. Um, the, and then the distance that we have the bathroom situated right now is, is, is as close as we can get to the, uh, the railing, allowing for still serviceability and having uh, the correct amount of, of uh, distance be, uh, between the, the building itself and the, the railing. This is a close-up of the uh, facilities within the bathroom. One of the stalls is an ADA stall, um, also with a children's changing table, and then the other two are, are just standard stalls. This last photo we have is a rendering that we had put together to visualize uh, kind of at an angle what the, how the gate would look and where that bathroom would be situated. The only difference that you might note here is that we didn't include the ramp that goes up because because there is a, a concrete slab that that bathroom is, is on, we, we need to have a small ramp for ADA compliance to allow people to get to that front, uh, to those front stalls. So there is, if you look in this, you can see that that uh, rectangular area in front of the bathroom is to depict the ramp. That would be um, the ADA compliant ramp to get you in. And um, we also wanted to include a couple of other photos to let you, to show the options with this uh, this brand of bathroom. Also, a prefabricated bathroom is is Exilu. Um, it come. We've selected a couple options that we think are fitting for the for the wharf, having both hor either horizontal or vertical siding um, with a with a wood finish to to kind of be in line with the the wharf itself. But this does have options for different exterior finishes if there were any um, desires to have that further further investigated. 
these are the two um, versions that we wanted to show you just for, for purposes of kind of seeing how how they can be modified but for the most part you know the guts and the 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 structure itself is, is maintains the same but you you do have uh, some latitude with with the exterior um, siding so with that just wanted to come back to the initial uh, reason for us coming back tonight um, moving into the phase two wharf project having uh, gone over these four elements and happy to answer any questions from the commission. Do we have any questions that we want to ask staff before we open the public hearing? Uh, just one is kind of um, relevant to the whole project, but I get asked all the time, can you just take just a minute and just um, refresh everybody's memory? And everybody, I talked about why the wharf's not being raised. Um, and we're talking about just putting it back to where it is. Can you just, just for informational purposes for everybody to understand what, why that is that we're not doing that? Sure, yeah, th that's a good question. And that was a strong consideration back in the early phases when we were coming to council with all the different options. So we did have our design team uh, evaluate all the different courses that we could go. And so they looked at raising the entire structure, making the structure out of, out of concrete. Um, and so, you know, with anything, there's there's different considerations, and oftentimes cost is a, is a factor that you look at. And so, we're for this project, we're adding 120 new piles, and then replacing, I think, less than a less than 20, but more than a dozen, I think, uh, deteriorated piles. So, you know, in the ballpark of 130-ish piles that are getting replaced with the new st st style, um, we there was. The total number of piles on the wharf is quite larger than that. I think we're, I think, triple that for the total number of piles on the wharf. And so in order to raise the whole wharf, we would have to raise, we would have to replace all of the piles or build up off of all the piles. Um, the limiting factor on, on, on ex the existing wooden piles is you can't build vertically off of them. Structurally, they're just not able to be, uh, to do that. And so um, the, Council at the time was was pleased with the idea that we have the all the new piles from here on out will be will be these FRP uh, style piles that could be built vertically off of, um, but at the current time, without replacing the entire wharf and all the decking and all the you know everything on there, basically rebuilding a whole new wharf would be required to to raise the entire the entire build, uh, structure. Um, we did do probable estimates of cost at the time. This project that we're proposing here now, at the time when we were estimating that was about, it was around in the $8 million range. Um, with the Measure F funding, you know, that was within our, our budgetary align, allotments. Uh, the next step up of, of raising the structure, um, depending on the material, started to escalate. And so we ended up, I think the raised structure put us at a $16 million dollar cost and then a concrete structure I think put us closer to the 20 million dollar cost and so you know and and also the would 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 necessitate removal and replacement of both of the buildings out there um, the decision that council made at the time was that we were going to leave the buildings as they were um, and and given that we didn't have the budget a, a, to double the project cost we just weren't able to to really exercise the idea of, of raising the entire world Thanks for giving us that history. Thank you. Um, I just have, go ahead, Courtney, do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just, I wanted to refresh why the parking was eliminated on the widening of the wharf. So, so during public outreach, we, you know, there was a lot of different options put on the table as far as what do we, do we do anything and how do we make use of the, that widened section? The, the reason for the widened section is, is primarily to provide additional strength um, to that weakened, the, the weakest link, I guess, in the wharf, the way it is now. Um, as we saw this year, you know, the, the reason for this project was, you know, exactly what we, we witnessed this year was that that's the vulnerable area of the wharf and we wanted to add strength and resiliency to that. Um, during public outreach, there was no desire to add additional vehicle traffic on the wharf and additional parking wasn't something people wanted. I think the what, you know, the message we were getting both from 
from council and from the community was that this is a this is a pedestrian wharf primarily you know we have a couple spots out there for ada and for deliveries for the businesses but otherwise uh, traffic is by foot you know stroller bikes things like that and and didn't really want this turn to turn into a, a vehicle wharf and we, we really just don't have the space out there like they do at the santa cruz wharf to have a large parking lot question go ahead paul yeah uh, the uh, security gate um, given it's 2023 and there's sort of more sophisticated modern techniques for uh, deterrence, we really need it. It's kind of ugly. Um, it's not very expensive, I suppose, but it's, you know, it restricts view. It's kind of a big, monstrous iron thing. It's going to be twice as wide. Um, is it feasible to not have that? Has anybody considered that? Well, so uh, I guess that's an interesting question. I, I mean, so it's primarily open as when you're when you're as a visitor visiting the wharf, like the gates, like you can there's a straight shot looking down the wharf. You don't see the gate except when it's closed, and when it's closed, it's usually evening, nighttime. Um, so no, there was never a thought of not having the security gate because I think the intention behind it being security for the businesses was was a driver, and that's why it was placed in, in initially. Um, so, no, that, that wasn't a consideration. Yeah, but when it's open and you're on the beach and you're looking at the wharf, now you're going to see a much larger metal structure up there. On, you know, it's quite a bit different than the original wharf. That, that was one of my thinking. Was not for so much as you're on the wharf, but it's other people. And the other, you know, like in that picture over there, you're going to see it <clears throat> when you're on the beach or on the cliff. That's the only thing. Like I said, there are a lot of ways to deter people doing stupid things today. Anyway, just a thought. Oh, the other question is, are the bathrooms plumbed into an existing sewer line and that's getting rebuilt as part of the utility rebuild? Yes, yes. So the, the sanitary sewer line that's out there right now, this will be connected to that. We do have to make quite a, some substantial repairs of that line as a result of the damage that was uh, incurred this, this January. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is, and I know this is not what we're discussing tonight, but several people have asked me, could you just briefly go over the numbers, what the wharf was going to cost before, to be repaired before it got damaged, what it's going to cost now that it's been damaged, and how much of the funding comes from the city of Capitola and how much from other agencies? So that, that'll be a, a primary part of the meeting uh, with uh, the uh, city council next week. Um, I can roughly, I think we're, I'm not sure exactly what's in the staff reports, but I think we're in the ballpark of around a $9 million project with the additional damages that have been incurred this year. Um, we have um, the previous um, grant through the uh, center, uh, Stone's office that we ended up through the Coastal Conservancy for 1.9 million. Um, we have in a recent um, from Panetta's office um, that proposed us for federal funding of 3.5 million. And then we have the um, insurance for the, for the wave wash damage, I think, in the ballpark of 1 million. And how much for Measure F? The yeah, I guess the we, have a, <laughs> we have a surplus on Measure F stuff now. Hi, good evening, uh, good evening. Chair and Commissioners. Jessica Kahn, Public Works Director. So your question, to make sure I understood, was how much was the wharf um, cost and how much they are now, and then where that funding's coming from, correct? Okay, so the original project was a bit less. I believe it was about $7 million, but that was prior to knowing that we were going to get federal funding. Mm -hmm. So the full scope of this project was always around 8.5, considering the restrooms and all the upgrades, the full desired project of the city. Um, with There's about a million dollars of storm damage. The total brings us up to about $8.9 million that we expect to, when we bid this project, to come back to. Um, like Kayla said, we had about a million dollars in insurance, 3.5 from our federal grant, 1.9 from our state grant, and then about $750,000 in general funds. And then the remainder would be in Measure F, which I believe is something like, I want to say $3.35 million. Okay, 
Great. And then at the end of the day, if you consider the cost of um, all of the construction plus the project that we did in phase one, plus all of the engineering and scoping that we've done over the past almost decade, the total price is about uh, $10.3 million for the project as a whole. Great. Thank and all of that will be re-reviewed at the council meeting uh, next Thursday. Thank you. That helps me. Now I can answer people's questions. Uh, any other questions on the staff report before we open the public hearing? Okay, we'll open the public hearing on the wharf item. If there's anyone here from the public who would like to speak, uh, you're welcome to come up to the podium. Pardon me? Uh, we're talking about the um, item A on the public hearing, the wharf, uh, the Capitola Wharf repair. Uh, which item were you interested in? Uh, okay, that was on our consent calendar. And you may not know that our meetings now start at 6 o'clock. So that item has come and gone. Sorry, sorry you missed it. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're opening. Is anyone here who would like to talk to us about the Capitol Wharf? Okay, seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commissioners. I just and want to make sure there's no one on Zoom. Thank you for reminding me. There is one viewer on Zoom, but they do not have their hand raised. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so who, who would like to start? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious why the, um, the bathrooms at the head of the wharf and even the bathrooms at the front aren't, I mean, are the businesses ever planning to be remodeled? Are they going, I mean, if they're going to be revamped at a certain point after the renovation. So for a public works charge, when we made the decision back in 2018, council just put, charged us with just the uh, structure itself, and we weren't to, to include the buildings as part of the consideration for the project. Well, I mean, um, I think my, my line of question is regarding the structure itself for the wharf is being, you know, revamped and, re, you know, improved and going to be way better. Um, the, the bathrooms themselves going in the front and the rear of the, the you know, the, the head and the entry of the wharf are going to be um, put in now and then the wharf will be reopened and then the, the businesses will be left to then remodel or reopen it at the time that they can be. Is that right? Um, is there, was there any consideration to be put to maybe incorporating the design of the bathrooms into the design of the new, I mean like how, how the businesses are going to then apply themselves or? So, um, not yet. Once we once we know the exact um, what's going on with those businesses, as we've learned along the Esplanade, every time we open a wall, we find something new <laughs> in those businesses. So, um, one idea, one of the reasons for the bathroom outside of uh, those structures was that there would be more design freedom if if those buildings were to be rebuilt in any manner. So you could open up the view because right now they you can't see towards uh, East Cliff. So just kind of being able to open the view and have a little more design freedom if if those are to get redeveloped in the future. But um, yeah. I'm just was curious because I'm. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a couple comments. Um, so I think there's like, I separate the two bathrooms as two different things to talk about. Um, the one at the entrance to the wharf, um, comments that I've heard back from uh, the community is, um, it's a little bit challenging and since it has a little bit of modern flair, but um, it seems like it could work in. Um, some of the questions would be asked around that. 
is, you know, can the cladding be, can we look at, can the city or, or, or a group of people look at the cladding options um, on, is that the best fit or the best like design option, but from overall location, I, I hear that, um, and I personally don't really have a problem with the design, the location, but are there options or selections that can be chosen different for the cladding of the outside of the building um, overall? So if if the if we get more feedback that the exterior cladding of the um, that structure that they prefer once RRM goes through, they'll, they'll be working with the subcommittee. Um, and we get that feedback. There's a lot of flexibility for the one um, right at the entrance to the wharf in terms of we can add different exterior finishes. There are many to choose from. Um, the one at the end of the wharf is different. There's not many choices to be made on the design of that one. And so with that, with the one at the end of the wharf, that's where I hear most of the community concerns regarding that bathroom. Um, right, right now the wharf house does have a bathroom that's open um, where people do use that bathroom. So there is a bathroom at the end of the wharf. We don't know what condition is, but like pre-storm, there was a bathroom that can be used. Um, uh, the concern around it is the utilitarian look of that unit. Um, how do people feel about the bathroom being um, so visible or so, um, you know, not, not a very private stall. Um, I know when you research and you read about it, you know, the drive for the design factor was, so you see people's feet, you know, contain drug activity, um, many other different things that would go on in a bathroom like that. Um, but I think it's a little bit unique in the sense of, no matter where we stand on a security gate, but there's a security gate that would be closed. So those sorts of activities would be kind of only during, you know, during the daytime when people are around, not so as much if it was in the middle of a park and at nighttime people sleeping in or something like that. So that was one concern that I've heard. The other thing is just how it looks um, and that how it um, forget any enhancements that might get brought together from the community just the overall feel of that bathroom in that location um, was a concern that I've heard and a concern that I personally have around that. Um, I know there's sensitivity around schedule and driving uh, forward to that, but is there a way that you know uh, the project can be designed that we know that a bathroom's gonna be at the end of the, um, at the end of the wharf and then that it be considered to be something of a different uh, sort of input around that, or is there really a need for a bathroom at this phase of the project right now, and could funding be held out for that, and that when, uh, if we want to, I like use uh, companies' names, or, but the wharf house, for say, building structure is brought up, and if that tenant that's there now, or the future tenant uh, remodels it, that that, may the bathroom could be incorporated into that, and we might not need, you know, there'd be a, a bathroom out there for public use, but it would also, you know, be designed into the building so they wouldn't have the aesthetic feature sitting at the end of our wharf. The comments I've heard from the community is like, the wharf has the opportunity to be something so special, and then we put a bathroom that looks like that at the end of the wharf. To, what kind of message does that send to the overall view of Capitola and we want the wharf to turn to be, I think, a destination when it opens up, and the destination with that bathroom sitting there, I just have some concerns over. So um, my understanding is that when we, when the city applied for the grant money, um, there's definitely a component of that that we have said that there will be a public bathroom at the end of the wharf, and we've committed to that, and so they'll, they'll want to see us execute on that. However, if the Planning Commission has concerns about the design of that bathroom, I think um, for you could make a recommendation. Like it would be really nice to get an approval tonight so the city council could move forward, but you could put in that a recommendation of, um, I'm sure they could do some type of custom work to the bottom so you couldn't see feet, you know, so that it's not open. It could probably be customized in that respect, but just um, putting, the concerns out there to the city council within a recommendation would be appropriate. Um, removing it would be problematic because the, the funding is tied to that site. So you did ask 
could it be removed and uh, thought about later and that would be problematic. I've uh, asked that question a couple times to our uh, public works director, uh, knowing that there have been some comments of concerns about that design. So can I follow up on your point? Because it's on the same thing. So, but I think it would be possible for us to include in our conditions something that says if the wharf building itself is going to be, you know, significantly remodeled and redone, at that time it seems like whatever public bathroom is out there should be incorporated, you know, in, in that building. And it could have access from the outside. It doesn't have to, in the restaurant, would have its own bathroom. But rather than having, you know, sort of a standalone, I mean, I look at this bathroom as almost sort of a temporary portable bathroom. And so if we got to the point where the buildings on the end of the wharf were going to be redone, and that would be the time to get rid of that temporary bathroom and have a new permanent bathroom included in that remodel. Sure. I think that's a condition you could place on. Yeah, um, so uh, locking on to that, is there, um, is there a time frame on when this bathroom has to be put in place? Yes, by the end of the, uh, by the time the project is final to get all of the funds, it would have to be installed. The funding from, and we talk about funding, so like the funding from Panetta's office is conditioned on that there is a new public bathroom installed at the end of the wharf, outside of the one that's at the wharf house? Yes, so uh, anything that was incorporated in the plans that we sent off and asked funding towards has to be incorporated into the and we reviewed the options about possibly just adding on to the wharf house building. Um, uh, you know, if the bathrooms are right there, that we, I mean, if this is a temporary solution, there is there an opportunity to do that other than have that? So I, I think it would be appropriate to um, add a condition that, um, like, at, at the time of redevelopment of the structures at the end of the wharf, uh, the city should consider incorporating public bathrooms or re, you know reconsider the, the yeah incorporate the public review of public bathrooms i don't think you want to I, I i would not want a condition on there that is absolute and says that they need to be removed at that time because i'm not sure if there's any um like legal implications there tied to this funding so i just i think we should state that we should relook at them at the time of um but I just don't want to uh, jeopardize anything in terms of funding. I can appreciate the funding aspect of things. Obviously, we wouldn't want to see that jeopardized all. But if that was a condition that it, that, that building might have uh, maybe never be removed, and so that might be, a, you know, let's say um, the new wharf house design, they decide not to incorporate it, and that, build, that new outhouse that's going to be put in has the potential then to stay there and be a fixture on the wharf for many years to come, right? Yeah, I think if, as long as we we can require that it be um, look, reviewed again and considered in the new design. If, if that's where it went, I would want to look to see uh, a different opportunity for a bathroom other than the one that is proposed today. Just with the comments. So, so um, one thing to know with the Portland bathroom is it is, if it serves its purpose there and we find out that legally, like if it complies that we could off site and then rebuild something um, down the line when the build structures are rebuilt it, it is it, it can be moved to a new site easily and readapted so that that is a benefit of the Portland Loop. so I'm um, sorry ju so just for just for clarification so if um, a commissioner votes no on that um, they're not in agreement with that bathroom that Jeff raised all war funding for the whole project. That jeopardizes the timing and possible funding of the war project. It, it would it would take a considerable amount of time to uh, redesign the bathroom. We'd, you know to hire an architect, redesign it, and then 
get the updated plans approved by the funding. And it's a, I'm sorry to go back and forth. Just, I'm just, I'm just really trying to say it's a portable bathroom, right? And so the design thing is just that it's going to be brought out on a crane and put into the plumbing that's going to be roughed in during the project. And so looking at other options of, of other baths might be more aesthetically pleasing for the wharf that can be put in. So the wharf can be getting rebuilt. It can be getting roughed in knowing that we have to have a bathroom. And I appreciate that clarification. But a bathroom that is more conducive to what the community would be looking for at the end of the wharf, would that, that would really jeopardize the, the project coming? That, that, that is my understanding. So it, it, I, I, I apologize because, you know, we're coming back to you and asking for an approval of a design. And I, I think there's certain mitigations we can put in place. I think we can do a recommendation to the city council that if, if there's the, any ability to modify those bathrooms, that they consider it. But my understanding is because these plans are what were approved at the time of um, the grants, that we kind of have our hands tied. I do think in terms of, um, I know, I do think that we could modify the bottom of the, the loo if we wanted to make it so that the feet were not visible. I think we could um, figure out a way to do that. But um, Jessica, am I missing anything? I mean, yeah, I think, Jerry, you're right. The, our commitment is to, is to provide a bathroom at both ends of the, of the wharf structure with in this as part of this project and we were kind of constrained by having the requirement to do that without making any modifications to the buildings themselves and so that was kind of the constraints that we had that, that drove us to this point so I think what you're saying I, I, I guess what I'm hearing is if we, we were able to change the design of that bathroom but still meet all the kind of factors that we were having to, to design around as far as parking trash receptacles and all of that within the timeline of, of still executing the project. We just need to deliver a bathroom. So I think you, at this point, it'd be, it would be hard to say no to that bathroom because then we're not delivering a bathroom, right? We need to move forward with having a project that says, yes, we're going to provide a bathroom both at the head of the wharf and at the, at the base of the wharf. I think it's probably difficult to go back in time and say city council or planning commission when they approved the overall design on the wharf that there's going to be a bathroom there and that they knew that today the bathroom would look like the one that's being proposed. Like that might have been, oh no, then we don't want a bathroom if that's the way it's supposed to be or we want the bathroom to be connected to the wharf house so it is more aesthetically pleasing. So I would, I'd feel um, just to my uh, commissioners, um, feel very strong that there'd be a condition that when and if the wharf house is addressed that that is the primary function or a, a key would be that that bathroom would be removed and that this is like um, uh, a temporary bathroom facility to the degree that we can be sensitive to our community and the viewing is just knowing that it's until it's a it's a complete band-aid until so we can get our funding which is our goal but also address our community concerns that that's not what Capitola is about and that's not what I think the vision of the pier should be with the portable toilet like that. I think in the in the, uh, in the 2020 time frame, that bathroom looked pretty much like what you're presenting today. The Planning Commission and the and City Council approved, right? When this, thing, when this project was first approved in 2020, there was a bathroom that looked like this thing roughly in the plans, correct? I don't know if we had the, the, the design for this bathroom at that point. I think we just had the locations called out, but I, uh, we, I believe we initially um, had it framed out to have two exclude bathrooms, but then that, the ability to have a second exclude bathroom in that location wasn't feasible. Okay. Yeah, that, that's my recollection, because I was here then, uh, I think we just indicated where the locations of the bathroom were going to be. So I think we looked at actual designs. So the ex loo is the bathroom at the entrance to the wharf, and that's what was proposed originally out at the head of the wharf, but because of the weight. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, 
I would agree with <laughs> Commissioner Jensen if we can write the proper wording for revisiting this in the future to eliminate this temporary thing, that would be good. It, it doesn't really, I have heard comments, it doesn't really fit in. Understand the weight requirements and how what you've got to deal with in physical size. So. Any other comments? One more question. Um, I'm wondering why the decision was made to have prefabricated units. Was it just cost, or was it, I mean, just ease of use, or ease of application, or um, just just the, the the prefabricated, even the bathroom at the entry. Um, Having it be so cookie cutter instead of customized with maybe showers or fresh shop paper or anything like that, it's just would it be overall cost or? So the the one at the foot that that brand, that brand does have the opportunity. You can have exterior showers on that, so that that is an option there. Um, as far as the when we brought this to council, we did have the plan to have a prefabricated bathroom just because we wanted it to have all the, those amenities. Um, and, and we didn't have an architectural team on the project as well, and that wasn't wasn't yeah it wasn't provided as part of the project team, so we didn't have that op that option. Yeah. Uh, for myself, uh, everybody else is done. Um, when I look at the area where the prefabricated bathroom um, in the Portland Loop one is going to go in at the end of the wharf. I mean, currently that whole area is a mess. I mean, there's dumpsters in there. Um, there's there's often, you know, garbage smells. And so um, I think the ultimate solution really does need to be that when those buildings are redone, that there is, you know, not only public bathrooms incorporated in, but some sort of facility for the garbage dumpsters to go in and that whole area clean, cleaned up. Um, so uh, for me personally, I agree. Um, I, I would like to see the door. I don't know if the door has to say Portland Lou on it. I mean, I, I would like to see it as plain as possible and maybe we could do something artistically on the side of it, have it painted. Um, you know, to ha have it look a little better, but but right now that whole area is a mess, and so that's why in my mind I can live with it because I see it as a temporary solution uh, uh, for an area that you know needs to be cleaned up. Um, for the um, bathrooms that are going in the front of the wharf. Uh, I hope that we can include some language in there that, um, you know, options can be looked at for upgrading the exterior of that bathroom. I was not completely clear from looking at the drawings. I saw whether the wood went all the way around the building, you know, how that actually you know, works. So it seems like we could approve those in concept with giving uh, you know, staff uh, the opportunity to, you know, look at some different exteriors, uh, uh, to even work with this new committee that's being formed. So if there is money to uh, upgrade those, that, you know, that, that can happen. And we're not really just looking at option one and option two for the, uh, for the siding on the bathrooms. Um, and um, I did have a question about moving the gates forward, the entry gates, because if you move those forward, you do have the staircase that comes up from the beach that's now going to be on the wharf side of those gates. So I'm assuming you're planning to put some sort of gate or closure there. So if you're closing the wharf because there's a major storm, and you think it's dangerous for people to get there, that that entrance will also have a may, way of being blocked off. Yeah, that's correct. I, we had this. We had the same thought. Um, so the the plan is to just have a swinging gate that just ties into the. For the most part, it's it's going to be open, so it marries up right. to the the side of the at the second 
the first landing, the top, the landing at the top, it swings open, and it would just be a, a gate that can swing closed to just provide, be at the height of the railing. So it wouldn't be right. a tall gate; it would just be the height of the railing, and it would swing closed when we when we did close the wharf. But otherwise, that would remain open. Okay. Um, and I, I will say I'm probably going to get myself in trouble with the community. Um, the design of that entry gate, I personally never thought was a wonderful piece of architecture or design. So um, uh, I'm hoping that if there is a committee that raises money to do some improvements out on the wharf, one of the things that they will consider is to look and see if architecturally, I know everyone likes the wrought iron Capitola, but the little stucco columns with the little tile roofs on them, uh, I, I've always thought could be improved. So um, again, we can let the staff deal with that. Um, I did agree with Commissioners SD about um, the big security gate at the end, because it is now going to be a very big gate. And even when it's open, you're going to have these, I can't remember exactly how tall it is, but it's like 10 or 12 feet. I mean, those gates are going to have to open and go against the side of the wharf and pieces are going to stick out. So again, um, you know, not to jeopardize anything, I would like to add some sort of condition that the, um, you know, Public Works Department and the Council look at trying to come up with some other alternatives um, that might serve the purpose of, um, you know, security there rather than the need for this large gate. And they may not be able to come up with anything. The, Property owners may object. I don't know, but uh, I do think it's something that ought to be investigated and looked at at least um, by the staff and the council to see if there could be another option there for for solving that problem. So those are sort of my comments, and I guess we need to put all of this into a motion. I'm assuming no one has any problem with the piling since we didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. I have just a question of clarification. Um, when we make a motion, um, are, you know, it seems like lots of we come back and um, as a commissioner or you hear the council sometimes get their hands tied from previous decisions that are made and stuff like that. Um, how can we, um, or myself as commissioner, ensure that it will be the main focus will be when the wharf house building is addressed that that bathroom will be incorporated into the design. If we're not allowed to do that at our authority level, how can we ensure that that comment is brought forward to city council and that they make it a condition if they're going to approve the wharf to go out the bid, that we have a connection. So it seems like um, what I've experienced is that you know, things get put in and then history goes by and they kind of slip through and then it'll always be there. And it's like, well, it's been here for five years and continue on. Um, so I'm looking for guidance and leadership yourself Susan or from staff on how well, we can ensure that yeah um, I think it's difficult to assure guarantee 100 percent that anything that involves politics is going to happen in the future because people change and attitudes change but I do think um, um, we could make a motion and we could include in that motion um, uh, a wording that if the you know buildings on the wharf are ever um, significantly remodeled or rebuilt that um, the option of having public bathrooms incorporated in those buildings rather than using um, the uh, temporary modular bathrooms uh, be something that is considered in that design. Uh, and I also would like them to consider in that design uh, providing areas to deal with the garbage in dumpsters uh, that are also located in that area. Is for me, there, it's all an eyesore out there. Um, uh, 
I, I would like to include another condition that says that, you know, uh, in the future that the um, entry gate uh, be looked at um, if there's an opportunity to uh, improve that design um, as, as the wharf goes forward. And that's pretty loose and pretty vague, but at least it raises it as an issue that, you know, I, I hope it's something that, that someone will look at. Was that, that, was that gate considered historic? No, not the safety gate. So we can... Or the other, the other, which gate? The entrance gate. The entrance gate, it shouldn't be historic because I remember that being put in. Right, we, we know that. And to follow up, I, when I did some research on the toilet from Portland, I don't know what's going on, I'm sorry, I lost the name, mm -hmm. but there is an option that uh, for artwork to be able to be included on it, a vinyl wrap um, can be included like that. So maybe that's something, you know, if, um, that would be an option that that unit is ordered with the least amount of company logo brand on it, and that we any option that we'd have to do or that uh, the city ordered that it would be able to accommodate any artwork or the vinyl wrap that they talk about in their informational stuff that's on the website. And it seems like a good place for that to come from would actually be the Arts Commission because they have money. Uh, so um, uh, maybe we could sort of word the condition that, uh, you know, uh, ask the Arts Commission to look at, you know, doing some artistic treatment on that uh, as as one of their next projects. And It'll never get removed, though. <laughs> I'm just kidding. When you put the public art, right? We're gonna I think that's a great idea. I'm just, I was too yeah. It'll be a fundraiser. Yeah, yeah, it'll be a fundraiser. Um, and then I think that one other thing is just that we would include um, that the bottom would be screened um, of that unit. Uh, so as much privacy can be built into that unit as possible. Okay. I have a few notes that I could try to Sorry. incorporate some okay. conditions. Want me to try? Sure. Uh, um, when the design of the wharf house is reviewed for a remodel or rebuild, um, the struck, uh, let's see. So we I shall consider incorporating public restrooms and a trash enclosure in the design and consider removing the Portland Lou bathroom at the head of the wharf. Right. The only change I would make is I don't think it's the wharf house restaurant. I think when either of the buildings out there is because you could incorporate it in the building that has the big shop as well. So not just the wharf house, but if either of the buildings are redone. Is there, sorry. To I have more. I know, I, is there? I, I would, I'm just I'm just struggling a little bit. Is there a, a stronger word we can use other than um, I think it, it still seems a little bit vague. Like, would it be looked at? I mean, can we say strongly encouraged? You know, um, from community response. I mean, like I think the document, the history that it seems like, as myself, I'm almost forced to vote yes on the issue because the funding that can jeopardize to the city. Being trying to be responsive enough to know that. It is the ultimate goal that unit leave as soon as possible. No, I think you're correct. So I, we can word this more strongly. Um, Sorry. Yeah. And, you know, I have to tell you, I, I don't find the design of that particular bathroom objectionable. And I, I haven't heard from the community the same thing that you've heard, that they don't like the design of that bathroom. So I, I, I don't want to get too into it since we don't have a lot to go on other than what you've heard from the people you talk to, what I've heard from the people I talk to, and that's really not a public process. Right. So I agree with you, though. I mean, if there, I just feel like it's a shame to not have a provision to where everything can be at least designed to be incorporated with itself, so even, right. the, even the bathrooms at the head, I mean, at the entry, the bathrooms at the head of the wharf, everything that all the structures kind of relate to one another, so it's not a mismatched um, process at the end of this whole thing. But, I mean, that's I mean, my impression. Yeah, I think one of the biggest mistakes <laughs> the city did when those structures were built 
they let the people who were going to occupy them design them and build them, yeah, rather than have it be sort of a, a city process. Uh, but I don't think that will happen in the future. <laughs> Okay, that was condition number one. Okay, and then the second condition, um, the Portland Lou door shall not say Portland, shall not have the company logo on it, and uh, future enhancement of the Portland Lou would be reviewed by the Arts Commission for the possibility of an art project. Um, and the bottom shall be screened. So, uh, the, uh, so this is all going to be part of the recommendation, right? It's an approval right. of the recommendation. So the Public Works Department and City Council um, are being recommended alternatives, are recommending that they consider alternatives to the gate, the security gate, the entry gate design, uh, the single bathroom, if, if there is an opportunity during construction or bidding. So just kind of leaving that door open, saying what we're hearing is there isn't that opportunity, but should that opportunity arrive, let's reconsider. Sounds okay. good for me. Um, and then the, the last one is tied to uh, looking at additional alternatives for the full exterior, understanding all four elevations of the, um, the three bathroom stalls. Exactly what we said. Someone like a make a motion <laughs> containing those four amendments. Yeah, I'll, I'll move that we uh, we approve this per the recommendation from staff. What with the additions we just added, which I think are four. Yeah. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. Vice Chair Christensen. And Chair Westman. Hi. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being here, Public Works Thank Department. You. Thank you. It was, it was Thank very you. helpful. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is the uh, citywide housing element update, um, um, and we're going to get a staff report on the progress being made on our sixth cycle update. Uh, thank you, Chair Westman, and good evening, Planning Commission. Uh, tonight I'm going to give you an update on the housing element, and Sean is pulling that up. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, our consultant team, I just wanted to, Brett Stinson and Veronica Tam and Associates, they've been working really hard on our housing element update the past two weeks. I would say we're doing about 10 emails a day and I'm getting chapters and reviewing them and sending them back. So um, right now we're, we're on the home stretch. They're not here tonight. Um, tonight we're really keeping the review to uh, just as an update and then two items that I'm looking for, uh, one item that I'm looking for feedback on two sites. So, uh, but Veronica and Brett will be joining us once we get the public document out and we do our public hearing on that at our next meeting in June. So next slide, please. Uh, previous updates in February, uh, Planning Commission had an overview of what the housing element is and what the task in front of us is. Um, on, we had a, ju a joint meeting on March 16th, 2023. And in that joint meeting, we again introduced what is the housing element update. And then we really got into an overview of the site's inventory, the process of a site's inventory and then for the first time revealed our first draft of the site's inventory and got great feedback from both Planning Commission and City Council at that hearing, which is in our updated map. Next slide, please. So tonight's agenda, quick overview again in case uh, anyone's tuning in from home and wants to know what a housing element is. Uh, second is I'd like to uh, move forward with the selection of two sites for conceptual build out and then go over our next steps with the exciting news of our public review draft being uh, available next week. So, next slide, please. 
So what is the housing element? A housing element is one of seven elements that's required within the general plan. It really lays out um, all the, it looks at our existing um, framework within the city and how we can best accommodate future housing. Um, and the deadline for our housing element to be adopted is by December 31st. And it's reviewed by the State of California Housing and Community Development Department. Uh, for compliance. Next slide, please. Um, and this I just went over, but really what, what are we looking for within a site's inventory is making sure that there is land suitable and available for residential development to meet, the lo um, to meet our city's regional housing needs by income level. Next slide, please. So the Cap city of Capitola, um, through the AMBAG process, um, was allocated 1,336 units within RENA, and it's divided 50% are within are extremely low and very low and low income, and the other 50% are between the moderate households and market rate. Next slide, please. And when we create a site's inventory, the first thing we do is uh, review what happened in the fifth cycle, then we remove any developed or unavailable sites. We add new uh, rezoned or available sites and do our site su suitability analysis um, and also look at what pending approvals are out there so 4401 Capitola Road will count towards our next cycle it actually counts towards both cycles um, and then we identify gaps and strategies to meet uh, affirmating, affirmatively furthering fair housing next slide please um, within Capitola, we, there are many different uh, angles you can look at for sites. Because we are mostly built out, we're really looking at underutilized sites. And we look at the existing use, how old are they, and are they ready for redevelopment? And is there any interest by the property owner? Next slide, please. Um, and then one other thing we really need to look at is what is the realistic capacity? If we had unrealistic numbers in our sites inventory, we would definitely uh, hear back from the HCD that we need to reevaluate sites. So, realistic capacity, and if you can just press forward, the, the basis of that is that we really need to figure out what the typical densities are within Capitola and that our projections fit within those densities. At the last, at the joint meeting, I went through examples of different developments within town and what their densities were. So, th that's the basis of many of the densities that you see on the sites inventory map. So these are the realistic densities. This is the map of what densities are out there. I'm not going to go through every slide of every property I went through at the last meeting. But uh, relative, uh, Capitol is a dense city. We, um, historically, we've been the most dense city within Santa Cruz County. I'm not sure at what point the, the city of Santa Cruz is doing a lot of development right now, so they might surpass us in the near future. But we are a very dense community and have a lot of dense development. Um, this is the site's inventory map. I don't know if there's a way to get the, um, uh, well, on the top it would say this is the site's inventory map, and it looks at some of the calculations within Capitola. There we go. Thank you. Um, we got comments back during the, planning, the joint meeting of Planning Commission and City Council, and if you can go next slide. During that meeting, I've highlighted in red the sites to be removed. Um, one comment was there's too many sites along Capitola Road on the south side. Also, uh, the building next to Burger King was requested to be removed. That's pretty much built out. I think that was an accident on our part, including it. And then in looking at the map, it was really heavy to the west. And there were great suggestions. So why don't we look at the Bay Avenue, uh, Capitola Avenue intersection, and really look all the way up Capitola Avenue. So we took a really good look at that corridor. We added the sites we thought were appropriate. North of uh, Bay Avenue on Cap Ave, there are quite a few multifamily, once you go past the donut station, that those would not, each CD would question if we included those. But we, we did add quite a few sites along Cap Ave as directed. The other item in the new map is that we've removed all fourth and fifth cycle um, sites. And that is because uh, they would be by right development at this point. So if, 
if a site has been in your inventory for two rounds, then if, if a developer came in, it would be a buy right development. So you would have no overview of that. So to play it safe, we're removing those. Um, if there are sites from the the last rounds that you feel okay about by right development, please let me know. I know 600 Park, we've all kind of been rooting for that one to redevelop and it was uh, a focal point in the last two rounds. But at this point, if it we thought it might be too risky, so we took it out. Next slide, please. This is the fifth cycle housing. So these are the ones that have been taken out as well. Next slide. Um, so here's our updated sites inventory map, and we'll come back to this. Next slide, please. And our new numbers. So this is how um, we're breaking down the, the, the income levels. Um, I think there's a projection of 50 ADUs for the future cycle. We may, we'll see where that ends in the end. Right now, what I want to uh, draw your attention to is the far right bottom corner where it says um, what is right now we're at 120 21% so we're 21% above our arena number requirement the map you're seeing today is not going to be the final map so we're kind of we're cushioning ourselves for this next step of getting public comment on the map getting feedback I know during the joint meeting there was discussions of should it be down to 15%? Should it be at 20? And we'll be bringing that back to both Planning Commission and City Council during the adoption um, phase. But at this time, we're not trying, we, we want to hear from people and hear if there's some sites that are inappropriate and have it come out through the public process rather than us getting it down to the correct number at this point. So next slide, please. Um, so this evening, um, within our contract with RM Design, they are going to prepare two concepts of what the development potential is of two sites and kind of show where the building layouts would be and illustrate the potential. Next slide, please. Where I've talked about this site earlier, 600 Park Ave. This was done, um, this site was actually, there was a redevelopment concept put together, I want to say in 2007. Next slide, please. It was done by Mid Pen, and I apologize that they flipped the image it's not north south but so this is park avenue the uh, 600 park avenue there i just wanted to give you an idea of what a conceptual what you should expect so this is showing at that time when mid pen did a study on this they were almost doubling the units out there um, with a new layout and that was a i think they had a phased approach i think there there are multiple iterations of what could have been done here but this is just for illustrative purposes tonight to just show you what what to expect from rrm um, next slide please so we're we're back to the map i would um i want to comment on one item we had some public comments that were submitted and asking about a few of the sites that were included in the map. So I just wanted to clarify those points and then I thought we could go out for public hearing and then come back and discuss uh, this slide and, and where you'd like to see possible sites. Um, so Jade Street, the community center, there was, well, I think the comment was uh, that from the public was, we really need to be thoughtful about not losing more open space, which is, uh, think that's near and dear to all of our hearts so uh, I just wanted to give an explanation and um, we should maybe when then we'll consider the sites but Jade Street Community Center there were eight sites allocated there and it was really um, to be clear maybe if, if we were to include this site in the inventory we should probably have a drawing included because it was for the area right behind the preschool to allow for teacher housing so it was a, that was the concept. It was not to be on the soccer fields or on the parks, but that's hard to decipher when you're looking at a map like this. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea. There was up to eight units and directly, it's kind of a gravel lot right behind the preschool. The second one was the Waterwise Demonstration Garden um, where uh, Capitola Road comes to Wharf Road. And actually that site on the map is meant for um, Shadowbrook parking mm -hmm. lot there's the second parking lot to Shadowbrook right. and we were thinking 
uh, employee housing or just some type of house, you know affordable housing on that site not not to at all impact the water wise demonstration gardens that would wouldn't be there the other one was the senior center garden the parking area or open space is what we were thinking there the, the senior center has quite a bit of space and so it could possibly be a few we we're just thinking it'd be nice to have a couple senior housing units on that site if they wanted um, but it, it definitely I actually had them change the note to say open space because it's definitely not meant to be right on their gardens so I think that was misleading how we had the first map um, identifying the gardens and it, it just gives that opportunity for some senior housing there but it would be vertical maybe over the and the last one, um, the mini park at Monterey Avenue and Bay Avenue, and um, that's the area that's in front of the produce um, sales and the fish lady. Right. And that is part of a commercial property. It's not an official park. But, um, so I just wanted to clarify those sites in the thought process, but there was definitely in, in considering all of these, I think, um, we could do a better job of outlining exactly what the where if we were to include these because I think it is important to save our open space. Um, and with that, do you have any questions before we go to public hearing? Uh, I don't. Does anyone have any questions before we open to the public? The space in front of the fish lady, that's not well that parcel is included so that space is included um, but I think if there are concerns about that we could get a little more specific right is that is a commercial piece of property yeah. that they use for commercial purposes at times as part of their it's just uh, a fish market yeah and then like the Christmas tree right. farm and the right. pumpkin patch. pumpkins right. just would seem like such a shame to lose something like that to the housing you know is it such a vibrant I mean, it was a gas station. Yeah, I understand. I just, I, I grew up with it, so it's like a thing. You know, you see it all the time. And it's hard to imagine the building there. All right, we're going to open um, the housing element discussion, uh, open the public hearing. If there's anyone here who would like to make any comments, uh, please come to the podium. If you would like your name included in the minutes, you can sign in. And the new trick is you now have to turn on the microphone to be able to talk into it. There's a little button at the bottom, so you get a bright green light. I'm Paula Bradley, and it sounds like it's on. It does have a green light. Um, thank you for clarifying about some of the sites where the open space and parks are. That's really helpful. And I, I just have a few questions, so I don't know if they can be answered here or at a later time, but I'll, I'll go ahead and just tell you. You ask questions. them and we'll see if we can answer. Okay, no yeah, I'll later. just throw them out there, see what happens. So I, I would like a little more clarification on the, the inventory where there's congregational sites. I, I didn't know if that meant housing on their parking lot or, you know, okay. above the church. I, I have no idea what that meant. Um, there's a, a the one-story apartments on 44th Avenue. I was wondering what the idea is. Um, that's the site identified as 50% uh, open space. It's kind of a park-like open um, apartment area. And I was just curious if that had to do with the previous uh, state legislation adding that units could be added to multifamily properties. So just curious about that. Um, and then I'd also like to know what measures Capitola is taking to ensure some of these sites would actually be employee or teacher housing. So I know they're identified as that on the inventory, but how could that actually happen that those sites would be that? Are there any in lieu fees or something that the city has? Um, I'd just like to hear about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, I believe that we can answer all three of the, your yeah. questions pretty briefly. If you want to go yep. ahead and do that, Katie. 
Yes. Yeah, so congregational sites, we we um, there's new strict state legislation around this that um, you can utilize, churches can utilize up to 50% of their parking lots for um, housing. We are being very conservative on those sites. We don't think 50% is where we want to go, but all of the congregations with sites within Capitola, we are suggesting a smaller amount be included. Um, and on 44th Avenue, there is a really nice um, single-story apartment complex, and I, I, we did a tour there uh, with our um, contract with RRM and Veronica, and there's just a lot of open space there, and in particular, there's some space um, towards the back that wouldn't be that disruptive to the whole layout. So they did, we were considering that site, but that you still keep that whole open space feel there. So again, just adding a small amount to that site and not, um, so leaving everything else in place and allowing for another building was the thought there. And then employee or teacher housing, this is something actually that our planning commission has been uh, really focused on at, when they approved 4401 Capitola Road, they placed a condition on there, which we can do in the future, um, tied to giving preference to people that work within one and a half miles of Capitola. So really that's to help uh, decrease impacts of driving and provide more opportunities for locals or people that are making a really a, a big impact in our community by working. Um, in terms of funding, you know, we, as, at a staff level, we've been communicating when, when mall redevelopment was being looked at, reaching out to some of the larger corporations within the Santa Cruz area and seeing if there's any interest in workforce housing and also reaching out to like Cabrillo um, and some of the healthcare. But at this time, you know, we don't have special um, funding structured, but I think more and more employees are creating that within their own budgets and being helpful there. But really conditioning for a local for a local worker preference. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, we do have a participant on Zoom. Good evening, Commission and staff. Thank you for the time to speak. Uh, this is Ryan Meckel with Santa Cruz EMB. Um, I just want to thank staff and the consultants for all their time spent on this. I'm really looking forward to reading the full draft housing element when that comes out. I did have a few questions. Uh, if you'd answer them, I would super appreciate it. I know that's not always uh, possible. Um, Firstly, just a comment on the consolidated sites notation on the site inventory. I assume that when you group those together those mean that each of those parcels has the same owner uh, is that the case um, another question with regards to the parcel near new brighton is that a parcel that the city owns or is that part of the state beach i know the city of santa cruz initially included some sites that were owned by the state but since they don't have um, land use authority over them they removed them from their their list as well uh, if that's owned by the state is their interest in development there um, and thirdly just with the comment with regards to the school and congregational sites uh, is the city relying solely on the state bills to get those densities to a point where they're developable or is, will there be a program or policy in the housing elements to consider rezoning those sites for higher density so that they can be built on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so do we want to? Sure. Okay. Those now and so the consolidated sites. I apologize, Ryan, but I'm. I our intent was for all the consolidated sites to be. Um, due to like shared ownership of the the sites where they're consolidated, but I will double check on that. Um, so I apologize. I'm gonna that one. I'm gonna hold off on for now. The new Brighton site. I've been in touch with uh, State Parks and kind of pushing for this site. I think, um, and we also included the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles site, which is also owned by the state. And it's really a request of they. They own a very large portion of Capitola within the New Brighton State Park. 
There's also a great need, I think, within their own employees to have employee housing. And so that is state owned. It's um, accessed off of McGregor and it's next to our skate park. And we thought that if there's a place, we definitely don't want to take away from open space, but that site is, it's kind of steep and accessed separately from the park and maybe an ideal location. Um, and so in talking with them, they're continuing to pass me on to other people, so I'm not quite sure how to answer. Are they interested in development? But I'm trying to get them there. Because <laughs> um, we do need them to show interest in order for that site to be included in the final map. It would be uh, removed from H by HCD. And in terms of schools and congregate congregational sites, um, we, at this point, uh, one of the action items that will come out within our housing element update is to look at, uh, right now it's being driven by state law, but to incorporate state law into our zoning code. So it's not quite a rezone, but it's acknowledging what the, what the allowance is under state law and um, putting that like as an overlay or just special requirements for congregational sites. So we will be an outcome of that will be to update our zoning within a year, I think, is how we've worded it. Um, so I hope that answers your questions this evening. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Thanks for reminding me again about the Zoom, because I do forget. Uh, so we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. And do you want to go over the sites, the five sites, and then we discuss them, or how would you like to handle that? Sure, let's, um, and I actually, I had to remove the Clare Street sites because they were in the fifth and sixth cycle. So okay. um, I thought that was an accident that they got removed, and then I was, um, let me just look. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, the first site I'd like to talk about is, uh, this is on 38th Avenue, it's the Bouldering Gym site, it's 1404 38th Avenue. It's almost uh, one point, it's 1 1.4 acres in size. It's owned by the Owl family and they do have interest in redeveloping this site in the future. When I did my tour around with our um, consultants, um, they, they thought this was a terrific site to look at, um, not to get rid of the Agility Builders site, but to kind of build things around it possibly and uh, build it out. So lots of land area there and there's not that large of a building on it. So that's one site. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the second one is 143041st Ave. This is the previous outdoor world. It's 1.09 acres. Um, I've had several phone calls with this, with the property owner here or the property manager over the years of, we just cannot fill this site. They're having a really hard time retenanting that space. Um, they also have been in contact with me about the site's inventory and interest in possible redevelopment. And so this is another one we could look at. And again, it would be keeping the two other sites that are occupied, commercial sites, and then possibly doing a redevelopment at the back of the lot. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, this is 4450 Capitola Road. It's a single story office building on the corner of Capitola Road and 45th Avenue. Um, again, it's single story. The one next to it is double two stories. So we took that out of the inventory. Um, so there's uh, with a single story building, this is one we could also look at to go vertical. And I'm not sure what RRM would decide on this one, but another site. And it is just over an acre. In in picking a site, it'd be great to get one that is larger, you know, to be at least an acre, but at a minimum a half acre um, for compliance with state. So this is not a requirement of a housing element update, but it's a really good practice so that uh, just so to be able to visualize what the what future build out could look like, and I'm, I'd love to hear any new sites that you're interested in as well. Uh, the one new site that I think we should find out about is um, it's my understanding that um, 
Now I'm forgetting the name of the grocery store. Uh, that's going New to Leaf. New Leaf is going to move into where the old Lucky store was, and so it seems that that building at the back of the New Leaf, where New Leaf is located, is pretty similar to the Outdoor World building, and it's going to be interesting to see if they have any. And there's a big parking lot back there as part of that. Uh, if they would have some interest in redeveloping the back part of that site for housing. Any others? <laughs> That's the only one. That's a great recommendation. That's the only one I've come up with. Uh, I mean, recommendation I have come Okay. Go ahead. No, I mean, the only other one I was thinking of is when you and I have talked about it, is the, the avenue by the freeway, which we are saying we're going to put RRM look at a feasible housing project there. But the other thing I would recommend going with some of the ones you've already proposed here. So drop that. Um, so um, one thing, Katie, I, th I just thought it was valuable that when I was talking to you this week when we reviewed this, it's just about your outreach that you did. Um, I think it's just good for the public. You, you reached out to mm. almost every property owner, so when you identified their site, that we had, it wasn't just, I mean, I was kind of impressed that it wasn't just like, Consultant in the city took a, a map and just started making circles. You have reached out to property owners, right? Yeah. So we um, we sent a letter to every property owner that owns either commercial or multifamily, any of our multifamily zones, properties within Capitola, um, and mixed use. So all of those property owners got letters. We had a Zoom meeting. We had a developer interest meeting, which was. Pretty, we had, I think, a dozen people attend that meeting, which was exciting. And um, and some of those owners own multiple properties in Capitola. So that, that actually will really help us when we go to HCD to say that we've got this list of interested parties. So yes, so everyone that I'm showing you this evening is interested in the possibility of redevelopment. I just appreciate you and your department's outreach. I thought that's important to make sure we share that so people know that. I'm going to give Sean a lot of credit, too, for helping me get those addresses out and letters. <laughs> um, yeah, much appreciated. Yeah, and so, and the next thing, um, I, um, and I brought this up last night, I spoke at public comment um, at the, uh, at the uh, city council meeting when they're talking about their projects and their goals for coming up, um, and trying to be sensitive to, we, I think we've all experienced that the the new restrictions and you know are things that I put in place with housing from the state and with the 4401 project on Cap Avenue and we heard from many community members about the parking impacts and stuff around that um, and then it gets down to the second next layer I don't know where the layers would start but then you have the Coastal Commission that runs through um, about you know we can't even address parking because it's in the Coastal Commission so I think it'd be one thing I would say, when we looked at these sites and actually talked to the property owners, did we also identify potential impacts if that site went to, and I always forget, you know, it's affordable, affordable, affordable housing or whatever you get to, but that, um, that, we, that a lot of parking restrictions or a lot of conditions could get made on these properties and so that that in access then parking can be restricted down and then it impacts all the neighborhood. So um, with that, it would be very helpful, I think, on the next time we see a map, could we see the line that would come across the city that shows the Coastal Commission impact or where they have jurisdiction so that when we look at it, we can be sensitive to that issue like, oh, if that is a site that gets developed heavily and then it went to the affordable, affordable, now there be a, could be a potential lot of impact to the neighborhood. And that would be just, I think, an outreach for the community to know that we're looking at that. And then um, the next part to that, I encourage that the um, last night uh, I asked the council to look at maybe reenacting the traffic commission again. Um, it's an infamous name that I think goes back um, many years, but I thought it would be good as the housing element gets developed and gets approved that the traffic commission maybe takes a proactive role and starts to look at parking impacts that potentially can happen in these neighborhoods before they're developed and so you know there's a plan of action or maybe there's some changes or you know some money can be budgeted by the council at that level you know to identify some of those things before 
Um, I know there's a tight timeline when a certain type of project comes in that the city has to scramble just for approval, and maybe we can't even have time to address the parking. So um, just going back to my request, just to see that line coming through that we don't have any abilities to address parking or Yes, we can add that, and if it, possibly we can add it before it gets published. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or before we start talking about the sites? Um, yeah, just one, one thing on the, um, could you go to the chart where we're showing in the public outreach meetings we're going to have? So I think we have it, uh, it's in the package. Yeah. You know, can we go to the... I have a slide on that. You want to talk about that later then? The, the next uh, next steps and what the public outreach is. Yeah, let's go. You know, I apologize. I should have said this before we went to public hearing. But um, the public review draft in the in the staff report I wrote the 8th, we are going to publish it on the 10th okay. um, just so that we can do a full review again before it gets published. A community workshop will be May 16th. So I will be getting notification out. I, I'll try to do that tomorrow or Monday because um, that's coming up soon and that's going to be by zoom meeting again and it's really an opportunity to kind of go over where we are now in the process and get some feedback on the sites mm -hmm. um, and anything else included in, in the document um, two other opportunities for public comment will be on June 1st at our next Planning Commission meeting we're really going to keep that agenda light so that we can really focus in on this document and get your comments as well as the and then City Council will also hear it on June 8th. Once we, um, after June 8th, I think June 9th is the last day for public comment. We have an obligation to respond to all public comments within 14 days, so that will begin on June 10th, and we'll get our uh, we'll get our responses out, and those will be published, and then um, we will submit to HCD following that process. So it's going to be tight. So we'll start our public hearings hopefully in October, uh, but the HCD has three uh, has 90 days to review. So it could be that our our first um, adoption hearings are in November. We may have we may be asking for some special meetings. So, um, but that is that that's the future. It is so Paul? Any questions on? Okay. Uh, so notification what's the how are we ensuring that the community at large understands that may 16th june 1st and june 8th are their opportunities to come in and so i'll be sending out a blast email um i was um i'll probably do that tomorrow i just need to make sure i have the correct zoom once i get the correct zoom links i'll be sending that blast email out i have a list of about a, a hundred people that have been shown interest as well as we'll put it on our um social media accounts to get it out there um and uh seems like this one could go oh, in the little newsletter that the city clerk sends out as well yeah People yeah we'll get that i think it's called capitola wave, yeah, capitola wave. so can we yeah. put posters up at like the grocery stores and places like that i mean it's, it's kind of old-fashioned but there are a lot of people that's a great suggestion yeah. post office and then we is always a good uh, one and they'll let you in the library in the library i'm sorry katie maybe i just heard you wrong on line five you said this is july 10th oh. email, or is it sorry uh i'm just trying to understand the track yeah sorry that should say june 10th okay. yep. so then yeah it's about june 25th is the first opportunity for us to send it off to the HCD. And a question, um, obviously yeah, you can look, just read the newspaper and see the history on um, what's going on with all these multiple cities. What if the city, I mean, what if the state does not have time to review it and get back the comments, which I can imagine that happening. But um, what, what happens to us if it's a drop off on their end, if we don't, that time like it's So, you know, a good lawyer. Yeah. That one I would, uh, I, 
we've never had an issue in the past, so I don't really know how to respond, but I'm sure that Veronica would know the correct answer to that, and I apologize for her not being here tonight. No, no I, I'm sorry. But, I, just, but yeah, if I it, see this huge push going through, and I see things at the state level get back. I just wondering. Yeah, I don't know if they give if you any submitted, grace are you period. In, and then yeah. the time frame's not on us. Um, once it's submitted, you know, we do have to go through adoption hearings, so the time it is on us. But I, I was going to ask Veronica if there's any uh, rhyme or reason to adopting something and then submitting, if that's even an option. But I don't, I don't know the answer to that. To say like we've got an adopted one, but then they give us all the red lines. But, um, okay, so back to the sites. I think then. Slides. Um, do you want to look at the whole map, or yeah, we just want to see if people have yeah. preferences for the two sites? Uh, do you have references, Jerry, for which two sites you think they should use? Is that, uh, just so I understand, the, the goal would be to show the community what those could look like. Yep. In fact. And I think we should have, it'd be great to just have, maybe we'll just consider all four and rank them, just in case there's a property owner that says, no way, not, you know, they don't want their site looked at. So it's the three slides that we had, and then also, um, do we? So we have four choices yeah. now. Four choices. So I guess maybe if we talk about what's your top choice. I'd like to see the outdoor world. <laughs> the one uh, 1430 okay or the climate 38 is that what you said 41st oh. it's the, I think it's the outdoor building yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> that's your top choice I just I mean it's just been um, okay so seen. what's your second choice um, it's newly But that's not on this list. No, but we're, did you say that that was part of our four choices? That was yeah, four our, choice? our four choices are the one on 38th Avenue, uh, which is basically where uh, the Orchard used to have its distribution place, the Outdoor World one, which you talked about, the building on the corner of Capitola Road, 45th, and... Actually, or the New Leaf could be, if because that was the one you were recommending. Right. Or the new leaf. Yep. New leaf's available. Okay. But conceptually, the new leaf and the outdoor world <laughs> are similar. the same design, right? Pretty similar. It's still over, I mean, the, the commercial space, how it interacts yeah. with the existing Interesting. commercial space. How to further densify that parking lot and to, I mean, the other, the orchard building is interesting, but I, I feel like there's other housing elements. And the, the other one is the 38th Avenue. It's agility bouldering. Yeah. Okay, is that what you're saying? Yeah, for the orchard, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm not using the correct term. Okay, so the I just want to make sure you're not thinking outdoor supply. Call it orchard anymore. I know, I'm but it's not. It's not the Osh building. It's the one. Yeah, that one. Okay. Thank you. So, Paul, do you have? Uh, yeah, so in ranked order, mine was 1430 41st Street, um, the 38th Street, 38th Avenue one, the Orchard Supply, Outdoor Supply, whatever you want to call it. Um, I actually like Clare Street, but I guess that's off the map now, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I would be curious about 4450 Capitola Road, but that landlord wasn't real happy with us um, on our approval of 4401 Capitola road so I it may be inconceivable to think of that wasn't happy with us has the building next door where triple a you don't own both of them I thought no no there's in separate ownership <laughs> okay so let's do that one yeah, that so outdoor good. world 38th and then yeah. 44.50 yep. um, my first one was the outdoor world my second one is the 40 uh, fifth one and just from the standpoint um, it'd be neat to see that design and if that was overlay with what is going to go in at 4401, I think it gives the community a good aspect 
or a good feel for what potentially could happen as the development happens in capital. And we already know what one large development is, if you want to call it large, at 4401 and so the 45th. That's why I thought it was important because that's probably the only unique site that we see high density kind of together. Um, and then the third one was the 38th, and then number four would be New Leaf. Oh, my number one is going to be Outdoor World as well. I think that that's a good one. Uh, I actually agreed with Jerry. I picked the 4450 Capitola Road, partly because we've heard so many complaints from that neighborhood about the impact of high-density housing. And so um, you know, I think we need to really show what it is. And then uh, 38th Avenue and then Well, Outdoor World rose to the top. <laughs> and it looks like we have, in second place, New Leaf 38th and two for 4450 Capitola Road. So 4450 Cap Road would be And I have to say for me, on the second down choices, I'm really flexible on that. And I think. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I think now I understand the 4450 Capitola see what that looks like from a parking standpoint because that'll be interesting. Yeah, so we have a first and a second. Okay, and then I'm hearing the third would be 38th. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, I think that co concludes my presentation to you this evening and I appreciate the direction. All right, so at this point, we will move on on our agenda and do we have a director's report you do um, so with the director's report tonight I the first thing it's kind of exciting we've had a rush of ADU applications so um, since October 1st of last year we have 14 new ADU applications. So tonight you saw one because it had the second story and it's required to come to Planning Commission. Um, when we did our housing numbers, our numbers were kind of low for last year for added units. I think the total number was seven throughout the city. And, uh, but since October 1st of last year, we're now at 14 new ADUs. So, um, Staff has been very busy because there's a 30 day required turnaround time on those. So, and it goes through planning and building at the same time. So you're gonna see a lot of new ADUs within Capitola. Um, I also, a uh, big announcement is our first SB9 application has been submitted. It's for 204 Hollister Avenue. Um, and we'll bring you an overview of that once we have more information, because I think it's really interesting to see how that's progressing and coming along, but right now they're going through site that's planning. The one where they have the little units now. The little units now, yep. So the property, when you're looking at the property, I, I believe it's the property to the left or the right, the right, and to keep two of the units or three, and incorporate new units as well. So, um, <laughs> which is interesting. It used to be a mobile home park. Yeah, yeah, um, or a mobile. I'm not. Uh, so then also uh, um, wanted to let you know that dining decks, so we have the prototype dining decks. We had our first official approval at the building through building department and that's for Britannia Arms. They're slowly coming in, but because of the storm, I think a lot of the businesses um, aren't quite on track as where they thought they would be. Um, so we are, you know, we're, the prototype design is what they're required to reinstall and I'm being pretty firm with that. We've been getting some requests to um, allow temporary to come back while the planters are being shipped. And really once you're at building permit stage, it's it's important that you know all, everything get ordered and the design that was approved for the long term be installed on the sites. Um, I also wanted to update you that I've continue to meet with uh, Mid Penn, who has purchased 1098 38th Avenue. And we should be seeing some movement uh, on that project in the near future. I think their first going 
Um, they're looking for some funding from the city, so I think their first stop will be at the city council just to talk about the ability. We do have some, we actually have a considerable amount of uh, housing money right now, so that will be the first stop is whether or not the city council will be able to help them with some funding. Um, there's been an update to our minutes uh, that you might have noticed back in January and February, we kept out the um, conditions and findings. And I kind of, I would love some feedback on that. The minutes become really succinct without including them, but I do think, um, so they're not required by law to be in the minutes. I was thinking it's helpful for the public to have them there, but it's not required by law. And if it makes it easier for the planning commission and you'd rather not see all the conditions in the, in the minutes, um, we could remove them at this point. Our, our new city clerk has informed me that it's not the typical practice, but it has historically been the practice in Capitola. So uh, it's just cut and paste. It's just cut and paste. And that way you can see exactly how we modified the minutes, the, the conditions. Okay. I like having the. Okay. Yeah. And then lastly, um, Commissioner Jensen had requested that we kind of do a look ahead uh, during our updates, during director's report. And so at the June 1st planning commission meeting, we do plan to bring up um, Commissioner Wilkes' request for the Color and Materials Board. We also may be bringing in Castagnola's Deli. Uh, we've had some issues with um, with their outdoor dining and being in compliance. Also a possibility of Reef Dog across the street. Um, and then a, a review of Santa Darius, the outdoor seating proposal. They're coming forward with a permanent outdoor seating proposal. And of course, the majority of that meeting is dedicated towards the housing element draft. So we continue to work with our restaurants, but we just want to bring them into compliance with all the rules and regulations within Capitola. Um, and with that, that concludes the director's report. Thank you. Okay. So do we have any commission communications at this time? Yeah, I do, sorry. Um Okay. I have two. Oh, sorry. Um, um, with uh, Commissioner Wilkes' uh, request, uh, to where are we looking at? I think what you call it color boards or could we bring back uh, the condition about the pay window at that same time if there's agreement so that it just seems like it's very uh, regimented that staff has to say that and I think we times we've had that come forward to us um, and maybe we should discuss that if, if we could um, at that time if, if it's I thought maybe the two are somewhat connected so one is uh, within our ordinance and it would take a code amendment to fix that the opaque and the other is just within our application requirements so I'm happy to bring both it would just just say the future process would be amending the ordinance which we've been doing regularly anyway I wasn't trying to carry any work I just no, no just, that's that's sometimes it feels awkward that yeah. maybe we can wait until a little later since we are going I think the housing thing's going to be big that Absolutely. Night. yeah why don't I Move those both to July. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. I just didn't know if, if there was any way to bring both those together, but I'm fine if not. It's just it just feels like it's something that might get pulled into discuss and maybe it might be easier for staff if that wasn't reformed. Okay. And then the next one you touched briefly on um, the outdoor dining. And so there's been one permit, right? That's one building permit. Right. And um, I've heard that there's some issues with getting materials and stuff like that um what happens if like some of the materials i know there's a design that was approved by previous planning commission if if a lead item is a year out because of, i still think we talk about COVID issues um are there any accommodations that are being made for that or will that be something brought back discussed or no so at, at this point um the lead time on the planters is about six to eight weeks, but we've known that for a really long time. You know, we've, that, that's, we've known that these need to be shipped here. And um, if my opinion of this is, I, I'm very much in support of our businesses and assisting them, but there's the old saying, uh, there's nothing more uh, permanent than a temporary fix. 
And at this point, we, you know, we've gone through two and a half years of a temporary solution, which was definitely needed in a time of a pandemic. Now that we're moving into building plans, we, we typically, when someone comes through our building department and they're moving towards a permit, if they run into hiccups, like they still have to stay on that same track and in the end develop what they got approved for in their building plans. And uh, for us to be um, allowing like a deck to be built, but then put the planters uh, totally, you know, rope up again. I don't think that really um, follows the direction of the planning commission or the city council. And I do want to be consistent with all applicants and all restaurants at this point. So I think they're best to plan it, you know, um, and if it takes six to eight weeks at this point, they'd be looking at a July construction project. So um, just trying to play it out, if, if somebody had a permit today and started building a deck, they wouldn't be able to use the deck until it's completely signed off for occupancy, is that correct? Correct. We would have to inspect the deck and uh, make sure that it complies with the prototype. Your question about if something's a year out, I'd be bringing a design change back to the Planning Commission. I, I wasn't trying to, I was, no. was there any exaggeration, I was just trying to get to a, a point that... Yeah. yeah, no, if there's something that like if, if all the furniture can't be ordered or if there's some type of issue there, I'll, I'll come back to you and ask for a modification to the prototype. But I don't feel I, it, it's a slippery slope once I start approving um, just changes to the prototype. I mean, and the permit, the permit application was opened up last. Oh, it's been open since last uh, October. Uh, September, October. Mm -hmm. We we did the the lottery in September October so yeah I yeah. I yeah thank you I appreciate you bringing it up and clarifying that yeah I appreciate clarification of course um, out of those fourteen eighty how many of those were using our None. not yet just curious <laughs> just wondering although I had a local architect comment he's got so many he's so busy with ADUs and like I don't know that I can do all of these so well, we have a prototype just send them there so thank you thank you thank you Yes, please. Yes. 